Okay, uh, welcome back everyone. We can uh, resume uh, where we had stopped. Uh, we had just seen how Paul makes an escape from the city of uh, Ephesus. And uh, we also saw how you know he goes to a different place from there, uh, but now he has, uh, uh, if you count the number of people with him, about a seven member team, you know, as he is continuing on his third missionary journey. So uh, let me quickly show us a map of the third missionary journey, which will be helpful to capture all that we've been discussing about. Okay, I hope you can see it, everybody. Are you able to see? Yes, Master. Okay, wonderful. All right. So let's look at this. We said earlier that you know he finished a second missionary journey, went to Antioch. Uh, we didn't read too much about you know uh, what happened in Antioch, but then the third missionary journey began uh, very quickly. Uh, and the speciality of the third missionary journey is. You don't really see, uh, you know, new uh, ministry as such. The route is the same route, uh, you know, this uh, that Paul had taken earlier. Uh, so primarily, the main cities are the earlier cities are the ones that you continue to read about. But we know that he spent most of his time in the city of Ephesus. So we start off at Antioch, the upper regions. Remember, we said Galatia. This is like the region of Galatia. You can see the name written over there. So the region of Galatia. So he went through there, came directly to Ephesus this time around. And he stayed there. He taught in the school of uh, Tyrannus. Uh, and uh, uh, what else did we see? We saw all the supernatural things that took place through his ministry, the uproar uh, that was caused because of uh, the man called Demetrius. And Demetrius was a silversmith. Okay? He was a silversmith uh, who uh, made the shrines of uh, Dina. And then, you know, that was uh, uh, by God's grace, it was quietened by a clerk. And uh, Paul escaped. Now he makes his journey out of uh, Ephesus when the uh, time got, you know, the, there was a rise in opposition and things got difficult. He moves out, he goes to Troas, and then he goes to the Macedonian region. Okay, so this is, uh, we saw last time this, that this is the present day Greece, this is the present day Greek uh, region. So he goes to the Macedonian region uh, and uh, uh, will go to cities such as Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, Beria, and then come to the Achaean region. And the important city of Achaia is uh, Corinth. We also know that you know uh, he uh, had already ministered in Athens, so likely that he went. Uh, Assumption, you know, some people say that he he did go there as well. He may have gone there and he may have spent some time there. So uh, he goes to Corinth and then he comes back, right? He comes back, uh, takes a slightly different route from here. So we will read about all these uh, city names. Uh, we we will read about you know Samos, Mytilene. Then uh, he will come back. We will read about uh, Milet. Miletus, Miletus, however you pronounce, and then he's making his way back to uh, Jerusalem. So the reason why he wants to go to Jerusalem is, uh, see, we we construct the uh, understanding of Paul's ministry uh, and you know Paul's intentions uh, with the help of the epistles as well. Okay, so though we read the book of Acts, we don't get the full picture. So we have to pick uh, scriptures from the epistles to add more to the life of Paul. Okay, now we are doing this course. It's about the book of Acts, but it's also about the life of Apostle Paul. So uh, I, I'll just share you know, some of the things that he uh, may have done. And we are picking all this up through the episodes. And I would encourage you, 
to particularly go back to uh, the APC publication known as Revivals, Visitations and Moves of God. And I've told us there, there is an account of uh, the book of Acts and the life of Paul has been very beautifully reconstructed uh, in the uh, chapter from that book. Okay, so that's how we will gain an understanding. So this would be the third missionary journey of uh, uh, Apostle Paul. He goes to Jerusalem. Uh, we know that he goes there because he wanted to take relief to the impoverished believers of Jerusalem. So that was one of the reasons, you know, uh, why he was in such a hurry to head towards Jerusalem. So he goes there uh, and from there, you know, we will see uh, a very sad uh, uh, sort of an ending coming over, coming upon Paul. So we will see his first imprisonment uh, after this. We will see his uh, second imprisonment in Rome. And finally, you know, his uh, sunset years or the last few years uh, that he will actually be able to live here uh, on the earth, you know, just trying to give a defense for himself. And uh, which is why we also look at the book of Acts as that defense brief that uh, Dr. Luke uh, wrote for Apostle Paul. So that's how his life ends. We read about the third missionary journey and then, of course, are the imprisonments and uh, the last days of Paul. Some people term the imprisonments because that is also a journey. You know, you'll notice that he had to travel. He had to travel from one place to the other place to be tried uh, by the Roman authorities. Some people call that as the fourth missionary journey because, you know, knowing Paul, he was never quiet. He was never silent. He was always giving witness to the gospel that he believed in. So uh, you might find in some literature that they have an additional missionary journey that they attribute to Paul. But basically, it was more about his imprisonment and his last days. So uh, intentional church planting, equipping sort of a missionary journey of Paul is this third missionary journey, which is uh, rather long, 53 AD to 58 AD. Uh, and he spent most of his time, uh, you know, some people say three years, uh, some people say more than three years he spent in Ephesus, right? So that was the place where uh, a lot of his ministry took place. So let's uh, continue from here. I hope that you, know, you now have a good picture. Oh, uh, I missed all your uh, comments. Uh, you're not able to see the city. Okay, we observe that Silas did not accompany Paul in his third missionary journey. Uh, there is there is no mention, uh, Brother Manohar. So I don't know if uh, you know he left somewhere midway, uh, and uh, you know I can't recall from the epistles about the exact uh, place till where Silas traveled with Paul. Of course, we know in Philippi, he was there. Uh, he was imprisoned together with him. Uh, but later on, yeah, we don't read about him. So maybe he departed and he headed back uh, to Jerusalem. OK, do you want me to show the map again in case you couldn't see the cities? Yes, Pastor. Yeah, OK. Be clear. Yeah, sure, sure. Let's do that. I'll try to zoom in. Okay, let me increase. Are you able to see now? Any better? Yeah, now better. Better than now. Better. Okay, okay. So then you can have a good look. Antioch, Galatia region, straight away to Ephesus, taught here, you know, more, uh, demonstrated the supernatural here. Uh, opposition arose, so traveled out, Troas. So we saw about the seven member team. Then he will go to the Macedonian region, spend some time here. So Macedonian cities are, here you have it, Neapolis, Philippi, Thessalonica, Varia, Achaean region, you have Corinth. And maybe he spent some time in Athens also. And then from there, return. So you can see the arrows, hopefully. Uh, so the arrow heads back 
So he's still strengthening the churches, heading back, slightly different route on his way back, Mytilene, Chios, Samos, then, you know, uh, Trogilium, Miletus, and then he makes his way back. We will see that he'll go down to Jerusalem. So he's in a hurry to take relief back. He'll touch Tyre, uh, Ptolemas, uh, Caesarea, and Jerusalem finally. And here, Jerusalem, uh, Acts 21, you, know, you will see how he gets, uh, they, they seize him. And from there starts his imprisonment. Uh, and, you know, later on, all, all his trials and all of that. So third missionary journey, officially, we are saying uh, it ends, you know, with his trip back to Jerusalem. We don't read. All the other missionary journeys were like a full circle. He went back to Antioch, the base church, the, the mother church, but no more, right? So this time around, he's stuck in Jerusalem. He took the aid back. He collected some money for uh, uh, Jerusalem. And also, you know, collecting money from different churches just shows uh, the, the feeling of brotherhood and unity and, uh, you know, camaraderie between the local churches. And it's beautiful. So whatever the others could give, they gave. And he took it back to Jerusalem. So I hope uh, you have a better understanding now. So this would be the third missionary journey. So this again is your Asia Minor region. This is uh, present day Europe. So two continents. So now we know in our current uh, uh, way of looking at the maps, this is obviously Asia. So this is Asia, this is Europe. So you see how in Acts 1-8, uh, the, the promise that God Jesus gave the disciples is, you shall be my witnesses, right? Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So ends of the earth, not really. You know, they did touch the ends of the earth, but thank God they were at least able uh, from their place here, right? We have Judea, uh, Syria, all those places here. From there, they at least went, touched another continent. They touched the continent of Europe. Uh, so Asia, Europe. Of course, you know, with so many leaders uh, raised up, and churches planted, uh, we know that from that point up until now, the work of the gospel has not stopped. So the ends of the earth, it's happening. Remember, we uh, began in the introduction of Acts, uh, the book of Acts, we said Acts 29 is who we are now. And the gospel is being preached through our lives to the ends of the earth. So uh, some regions were actually covered you know, by the ministry of Paul and uh, the team members. So agency is also another important part that you know you might come across. So uh, you can register that agency. Okay. All right. So we stop sharing the map and let's go back to acts 20 uh, we have seen how paul you know he left uh, ephesus he went to macedonia uh, and in greece he spent three months so a few other uh, things we can pick up from the epistles is that it's likely that when paul was in ephesus he wrote uh, first corinthians so he wrote that book to instruct the corinthians remember he had to flee corinth right even there uh, there was a lot of opposition so uh, he wrote the book from ephesus okay and uh, it is said that he wrote second corinthians from macedonia so uh, paul was in macedonia and that's where he actually wrote uh, the second book of Corinthians. And later on, uh, when he goes to Corinth, uh, it is said that he wrote an epistle to the Romans. So, you know, the book of Romans was written when Paul was in 
Corinth. So these are all where where are we getting all this information? We are getting this information from the epistles, you know, things that he will mention when he writes these letters. And uh, I'm not mentioning the scripture, the the chapter and verse, but uh, I'm taking this information from the APC publication. Okay, uh, revivals, visitations, and moves of God. So you could uh, study it from there. So now we are in Macedonia with Paul. Uh, and let's continue Acts chapter 20. So from verse 7. Yeah, verse 7. Let's uh, move on. Ministering at Troas. Okay. So he goes to the Achaean region. Now he's back. He's back at Troas. Uh, could somebody please read from verse 7 to verse 12? Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a young, certain young man called Eutysus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him and embraced him, embracing him said, Do not trouble yourself for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive and they were not a little comforted. Yes, thank you, uh, Christopher. Never a dull moment in the ministry of Paul uh, during his missionary journeys. So he comes back to Troas and uh, the kind of individual that Paul was, you know, he wanted to ensure that he equipped all these uh, believers really well. So praise God in Ephesus, he had, you know, uh, that kind of time in the school of Tyrannus. So Two years, you, you can just imagine together with me, two years is a long time. And he was teaching in the school of Tyrannus, you know, every day. And, uh, you know, commentators say that he would have probably taught from the time of, let's say, 11 a.m. to about 4 p.m. every day. Okay, because that would have been the break time uh, of the school of Tyrannus. And it would have also been the time when... Uh, people probably rested from their uh, vocations. So that rest time, Paul made use of that. And for two years, thousands of hours, he taught them. What in all did Paul teach them? You know, we, we can pick up bits and pieces from here and there, but we can assume that he covered, you know, everything he knew from the scriptures, from the teachings of Jesus, which were passed on to him, from the experiences of the apostles. You know, absolutely everything that he could cover, he would have taught the people there in Ephesus. So uh, he, he was the kind of person uh, who wanted to impart. And you see his desire, his concern. You know, when he writes to the Corinthians, we read about the concern which he had for all the churches. Okay, So he comes across as this apostle with a great burden incredible burden for the churches that he planted, the believers that he raised up. So now he's in this place called Troas and uh, we can observe that there the church is established there or ecclesia, the gathering of believers and they have a pattern somehow. Okay, till now we didn't read uh, first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Earlier we read, they went from house to house breaking bread, right? They were meeting daily. They were meeting in homes. They were meeting in the temple. That's what we saw when the church actually began uh, in uh, uh, the book of Acts. But now somewhere you read about the first day of the week when bread was broken. So communion, communion on the 
first day of the week so sunday uh, people you know take that as sunday first day of the week uh, communion was taken by the churches so many churches uh, adapt this and they practice it but then you know you these practices have emerged over time and for whatever reason uh, such things were practiced uh, and of course you know uh, they are adopted by some of the churches today so we see a pattern okay what else so paul ready to depart to the next next day spoke to them and continued his message until midnight so you see his concern he is making use of the time that he has he didn't have much time in Troas, but he wants to impart maximum. So Paul, the zealous guy that he is, he's talking and talking and talking and is going on till midnight. Now, just think with me, you know, these days, if you have uh, a service which is slightly longer, people will already be quite tired and they will have feedback for the pastor. That why is, why is it being dragged for so long? But the people in Troas, they were eager to listen because Paul, uh, I'm sure he had an idea that he may never come back um, in this direction again. And he had to deliver the message that God had put in his heart, you know, no matter how long it takes. So Paul is talking till midnight, verse 8. There were many lamps in the upper room where uh, they were gathered together. So they had lit up the place. You know, to ensure that people were comfortable, they were able to listen to Paul's message. So there was a certain young man by the name of Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. So some places where you read about uh, the layout of the place where these uh, uh, believers of Troas gathered, it's likely that he was sitting, uh, you know, in some corner something like a balcony he was sitting in, in a place like that uh, and he was overcome by sleep why was he overcome by sleep again we can we can make some assumptions uh, these people would have worked all day long they were first of all tired second paul is talking so much he's dragging his message up until midnight so it's a rather long sermon that he has and because of the lamps so they used to light these lamps with uh, some kind of a fuel and uh, it may be the 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 smell of that oil burning was also something that that uh, uh, was uncomfortable and it could have you know caused people to feel drowsy so for all these because of all these reasons this man Eutychus a young person he fell asleep and the unthinkable happened okay what happened uh, he was overcome by sleep as paul continues speaking he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead so so unfortunate he fell from uh, the third story and he was actually dead uh, so you know some people joke around and say that uh, uh, people even slept when Paul preached. So it's okay. You know, if someone sleeps um, when you're preaching, don't feel too bad about it. Okay. So, but we know there were other, other uh, reasons why this man could have fallen asleep. Uh, but then what happens when this uh, sad incident takes place? You see the supernatural power of God. Think about a preacher who's preaching and somebody falls dead in your meetings. What would you do? Right? If you were the preacher, what would you do? Uh, Paul went down, fell on him, embracing him. Uh, uh, he said, do not trouble yourselves for his life is in him. And basically, you know, he ministered to this young man and this young man was resurrected back to life. And, you know, Paul goes back, he uh, continues his, his uh, meeting, they broke bread, they ate, he talked till daybreak. Then he departed. So just think about this. Nothing could stop him, not even a dead man. He just went and ministered to the dead man. The man was raised from the dead. And of course, we read when he was leaving Troas, that the man was brought back. He was actually alive uh, because he had risen from the dead. Okay, so yeah, incredible uh, ministry there in Troas uh, by Paul. Yeah, Yeshri Kumar, you have some comments? So I have a question. Uh, yeah. um, Pastor, in the seventh word and in the and uh, in the 
in the 11th word the bible he is saying is that uh, you know they broke the bread and eaten so is it represents to the holy communion because um, uh, both the time they took the communion after the resurrection uh, and after thank you that's my question is that the communion it represents communion that's yes uh, shri kumar that language is used for communion only went house to house breaking bread breaking bread is communion thank you boss yeah and thank you for noticing that uh, within 24 hours twice they actually uh, you know had the communion that's that's what we understand okay so that's how he ministered in troas and he went ahead from there so let's read on from verse 13 uh, could somebody please read till 16 13 to 16 yes asha today seems to be your day please go ahead paul and by land to associates where he had arranged for us to join him while we traveled by the, by ship he joined us there and we sailed together to mitilene the next day we sailed past the island of caius The following day, we crossed to the island of Samos, and a day later, we arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus, for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of Pentecost. But when we landed at Miletus, he sent a message. Sorry, Pastor. Ah, uh, that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Ah, uh, so. you know as it is given here it's quite clear it's basically just covering the the locations where paul had been uh, and mention of all those places that we saw on the map you know mitilene chios samos uh, uh, trogilium miletus okay. uh, and paul it says decided to sail past ephesus meaning he didn't want to go there because recently you know a couple of months ago there was this approach so it was dangerous for him to actually go back uh, so he didn't go to ephesus uh, but he was hurrying right to move to jerusalem and he wanted to be there possibly uh, on the day of pentecost so that he could take the relief so uh, no problem asha we will continue to read uh, but i maybe I, someone else can read because she's already uh, read quite a bit so from verse 17 would uh, someone please be able to read you can read till 38 the entire section 17 to 38 Yesko. Are you getting me? I can hear you. Okay. Um verse 17 onwards. But when we landed at Miletus, he sent a message to the elders of the church at Ephesus asking them to come and meet him. When they arrived he declared, "You know that from the day uh, from the day I set foot on the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears. I have endured the trials that came to me from the plots of the Jews, and never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I have I I have had one message for Jews and Gentile uh, Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin." and turning to God on of having a uh, faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am bound by the spirit to go uh to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use I use it for finishing the work assign assign me by the lord jesus the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of god and now i know that none uh, none of you to whom i have preached the kingdom will ever see me again i declare today that i have been faithful if anyone suffers eternal death it is it's not my fault for i didn't shrink back from declaring that god wants you to know declaring all that god wants you to know 
So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed, uh, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, for, uh, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know that the false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you day and night and my many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who were with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad most of all because he said that they, uh, that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ship. Yes, uh, thank you, Kung. That was, uh, again, a pretty long passage there. Uh, but it very beautifully summed up the heart of Paul, uh, the heart behind the ministry that he did, uh, and especially for the Ephesians. So, uh, you know, we, we know that he did not go to Ephesus because it was dangerous at this point for him to visit the city. But what he did was he asked for the leaders, right? So in verse 17 from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, meaning he uh, asked, he had sent somebody, he asked that person to invite the elders of the church to come to Miletus where he was. So the elders came. So notice, so many things we are observing, you know, first day of the week when they broke bread. So there are some patterns that have emerged in local churches, uh, patterns of their format, uh, their leadership structure. So elders of the church. So there were elders in the church of Ephesus. So it's no longer just the apostles managing. The, the churches, but there are leaders, there are elders. So the elders of the church of Ephesus came. Uh, now, what else do we read? You know, he begins to talk to them. He And this, this uh, speech or this sharing uh, is very heartfelt because Paul knows that he will not have another opportunity to talk to the elders. So you know, do, do you see the kind of relationship that he has built with the people? Yes, he taught them for two years, but it was not like, uh, okay, let me equip you. You go do the work of the ministry and that's about it. But he had built a very, uh, you may even say there was an emotional connect that he had with these people whom he had uh, raised up. You know, in the Lord. So it's very heartfelt uh, sharing and uh, he was pouring out his heart in other words. So he uh, basically he touches on different things that might be relevant to the elders. So he shares you know about his own uh, intentions. He says that uh, he served the Lord. He served the Lord uh, with a good attitude, with all humility. Okay, humility before God, before man. He served uh, the Lord. He served during trials. So the elders of the church of Ephesus had already seen how there was an uproar against uh, Paul and how he must have struggled. Right? Initially, he tried sharing to the Jews, but they, they were not uh, very receptive. So he had to find the school of Tyrannus. So it was not easy. He struggled. Uh, you know, in his ministry in Ephesus and they had observed it. So that's why he's saying many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful. So you see, with humility, with, uh, you know, suffering for Christ. And this suffering is uh, 
suffering opposition, suffering persecution for Christ. And then you know, he goes on to say that uh, his ministry was such that he gave it his best. So he's saying, I kept nothing back. You know, the way uh, we see passages in the Old Testament, which says, enlarge your tents, hold nothing back. Paul never held anything back. He gave his all uh, in the ministry. And he says, I never held anything back that would have been helpful to you, but proclaimed it to you and taught you. How did he minister? He says, both publicly and house to house. So he made every effort to impart the word and the, the work of the spirit to these believers at every opportunity. And verse 21, he's saying, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So basically the proclamation of the gospel. And, uh, you know, he goes on to say that he is no longer, you know, uh, accountable in the sense that he has done his best. He exhausted you know, his energy, his resources, uh, he held nothing back so that the Greeks and the Jews would hear the gospel and uh, have an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And, you know, he ministered in such a way that he did not even count his life dear. So we are observing that it was quite dangerous in every city right from the beginning. You, know, you remember Sidia of Antioch. From that time, uh, there were crowds which were against Paul and they were even chasing him city after city. But that did not stop him. You know, the fear for his own life, his own uh, preservation, his own protection, that did not stop him. But he continued the work of the ministry. But look at his intention okay very beautiful in verse 24 he says uh nor do i count my life dear to myself so that i may finish so that is the kind of person apostle paul was his eyes were fixed on the goal uh, in our first year we've done that fulfilling god's purpose for our life Apostle Paul is a beautiful example. Of course, Jesus is always our greatest and best example. But Apostle Paul uh, is another additional example for us of a man who wanted to fulfill the purpose of God for his life. And he says that I may finish my race with joy. So he wanted to finish the work that God gave him well. With joy simply uh, uh, tells us that he wanted to do it well, complete it uh, with excellence. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So he basically is just pouring his heart out and we can see that. And he was telling the elders, look, I did my best and I in my my goal my intention is to finish this ministry that the Lord Jesus has called me to do. And he goes on and he says that uh, uh, nobody has an excuse because I've shared the gospel. So, you know, I'm not responsible for the blood of all men, he says. Uh, or his way of saying that the opportunity is before all because I did my job of preaching the gospel. Now it's up to them if they want to respond or not. Uh, and then you know, he goes on to encourage the leaders and see how beautifully he puts it. Verse 28, he says, the way I have, uh, uh, you know, held on to the ministry that God gave me, I want you to hold on. So he says, take heed or take, <coughs> hold on to the ministry that God has called you to. Uh, and he also says, to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So who is it who gives us the ministry? He points out here, he says, the Holy Spirit, all you elders, you received your responsibility, your ministry from the Holy Spirit. So God is the one who gave you the ministry, not you by yourselves, but God gave you the ministry. So take it seriously. Take it, uh, hold on to it. You know, serve well in the ministry that God has given you. And he says, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers or uh, the Holy Spirit has made you uh, the elders to shepherd the church of God. 
So what is the responsibility of the elders? Beautiful shepherd, just the way Jesus is our good shepherd. He's a shepherd to the extent that, you know, the good shepherd lays down his life. So building up the church, nurturing the church in every way possible, even sacrificially, you know, if uh, it calls for that. So he says, elders, you be good shepherds to the church to which the Lord Jesus or, or uh, the Holy Spirit has assigned you. And how did he actually, uh, you know, bring this or, or give birth to this church or the body of Christ? He says he purchased with his own blood. Okay, very beautiful. So we recognize that the church is so precious. The body of believers is so precious. You know, we don't take the body of believers lightly because it isn't free. The Lord Jesus paid his blood as a ransom. He gave his life as a ransom to purchase the body of believers. And which is why we must value every believer. Okay, anyone part of the kingdom of God, we have very high value because their, their life in Christ didn't come easy. The Lord Jesus himself shed his blood for these people to be purchased. So you see how Paul is thinking about the church and why the church is so valuable to him and why he has put his life on the line to raise up and equip the body of believers. It's a very heartfelt message. He's clarifying his intentions and how he is actually thinking about the ministry, how he is actually thinking about the people of God. You know, it, it would really help us as we serve God's people. So he uses all these things, these words, where says the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, shepherd the church, which whom uh, God has purchased with his own blood. And then you know, he goes on to say that there will come a time uh, where you know you, you might even have to uh, deal with opposers within the church. You know, you, you will have, he puts it as uh, there will be wolves. Yeah, savage wolves, he says, among you who will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So false teachers, false prophets, people with wrong uh, intentions may arise from among you. But please make sure that you continue to shepherd the flock or protect the flock from all kinds of wrong teachings. So he's warning them. He's warning them in verse 31. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So he had done, uh, you know, intentional uh, and uh, sacrificial ministry among the church of the uh, Ephesians. And he says, please preserve what I have done. Okay, don't let any of these false teachers or false prophets or false apostles uh, have their way okay so basically he's telling them you have the responsibility to protect the church of the lord jesus christ uh, and then you know he goes on to commend them uh, he encourages them right uh, and he he tells them I want you to hold on to the word. So in verse 32, he says, the word of God, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So you see the value that Paul placed on the word. No wonder, thousands of hours, he taught the people the word. How, how is it that the people can, uh, you know, overcome external opposition, internal challenges, you know, uh, just by themselves or just by their uh, state of being motivated or inspired. It's not possible, right? It, it wouldn't be possible by just being encouraged and motivated. They needed something concrete and that was the word of God. And so he's reminding them, look, for, for two years, I taught you the word because the word has the ability to build you up, 
to give you the inheritance among the saints so it's so important this is how churches should be built equipped strengthened established without the word of god being taught to the believers now they will never be able to grow up in the lord so all this is coming from paul's heart and he's saying see this is how i've done the ministry i want you to continue this hold on to the world word because it is the word which has the ability to build you up and then you know he talks about his uh, his uh, sincere work he says i do not covet anyone silver or gold or apparel so again so much to learn from this as ministers of god uh, if there was one person who could have gained the favor of the people and we know there were many rich people in in his team and even when you look at the city of ephesus and we saw you know right uh, 1 to 5 million dollars of money was burnt up as as these uh, uh, people who had turned from black magic you know put their faith in the lord jesus so there were opportunities for paul to build his own kingdom to you know uh, amass wealth for himself he could have done all kinds of things but he says look i was very sincere i had only one goal i wanted to uh, win people for the gospel equip people uh, in in the word of god establish them so that the kingdom of god is established and i did not have any sort of a uh, covetous intention silver or gold or apparel you know my eyes were not on those things to uh, build myself up and then you know he goes on to say uh, yes you you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me i have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the lord jesus that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive so that was his attitude what was apostle paul's attitude as far as possible uh, i will sustain myself i will not be a burden to the believers uh, i will uh, have an attitude of giving you know wherever possible i will give uh, to the believers and you know he says that the believers and the elders uh, had observed him laboring right working very hard so we we know that he was a man who was so determined so focused so zealous for the gospel and so hard working so hard working in the uh, ministry but even in work so that he can have a good testimony right that nobody should be able to say uh, you stole from us or you know we were the ones who uh, gave you the resources you needed did he take uh, any help from believers and leaders yes he did but only at times when he needed that support but in general you know he was a man who worked very hard uh, to maintain a good testimony among the believers and uh, very uh, heart touching the last section of chapter 20 was 36 and when he had said these things he knelt down and prayed with them all uh, was 37 then they all wept freely and fell on paul's neck and kissed him 38 sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke that they would see his face no more and they accompanied him to the ship so so there was a bond which had been built with these leaders and these believers and such a beautiful bond you know he never looked at them as okay you know you're my work now you go uh, extend the kingdom and that's all there was a relationship now there was love there was tenderness uh, uh, they were able to relate with him you know in, in such a close and intimate way and so there was really a beautiful bond that he had developed with the elders of ephesus and i'm sure knowing paul's attitude and approach this would have happened uh, in in all the churches but the good thing was he had a lot of time in ephesus okay so uh, let's pray we'll uh, wrap up for today uh, and uh, you know we th- have three more classes so we should be able to complete the book of acts uh, could somebody please pray uh, as we close holy father lord we thank you for this powerful teaching from the life of paul lord so precious teachings for thank you for this lord help us to emulate it and to 
imbibe it into our lives, Father, that we may follow this pattern of Paul in our life also. He has preached day and night without ceasing, in spite of persecutions. Lord, what a beautiful verses he spoke to the Ephesian church. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for teaching it. Thank you for the precious teaching from Pastor Nancy. Bless her, Lord, immensely for the ministry she is doing and their passion for teaching like this to your people. We thank your name and praise you. Help us, Lord, having heard this in a fully, Lord, take it into our hearts and spirits and let this be our pattern also in our life. Paul said that, that I may finish my race with joy. Help every one of us. Also, to say the same word in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Manohar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for staying on longer. God bless you. Have a, a great weekend. Um, we shall meet again next Friday. Bye for now.